was just sheer power that kept it in the air. The bullseye is six inches, but at 500 at 500 meters, it's it's less than half the width of the blade on the front of the rifle. And on the strafing run, he took a round right through the head. I'm Dwayne Berg. I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota, raised on a farm in Fargo, North Dakota, uh, near Fargo, North Dakota. Actual town was Hillsboro. I uh, joined the Marine Corps. At the age of 22, I joined the week that my draft papers would have come in. And I decided I didn't want to be drafted, so I joined the Marine Corps instead. Of, instead of going for two years in a draft, I went for four years in the Marine Corps. Had the privilege that the recruiter that recruited me asked me if I was interested in working in the aviation field of the Marine Corps, and I tested high enough, so I went to basic training with the indication that I would be in the aviation department of the Marine Corps rather than the grunt part of the Marine Corps when I got out of basic training. So left for San Diego, California in January of 1964, 13 weeks of basic training and then four more weeks of infantry training at Camp Pendleton. So I finished that in May and then got my orders and went to Millington, Tennessee, which was north of Memphis, Tennessee, which was Naval Air Technical Training Center for all of the aviation at the time. Interesting thing about the Marine Corps is they always worked with the Navy and of course we were very much competitive, but all of the training schools that I participated in had both sailors and Marines in it. And as a result, you had Navy instructors and you had Marine instructors that would share the responsibility. So I was at Naval Air Technical Training Center and took a 31 week course in basic aviation and communication navigation equipment. I was fortunate, I was top Marine in my class, so I had the choice of duty. and. Uh, at the time I went as an E-1, I was promoted to PFC, which was an E-2 in the Marine Corps when I was there. And then because I was top in the class, I made a meritorious promotion to Lance Corporal E-3 and then was assigned to, this was good duty, I was assigned to a Reserve Training Command in Olathe, Kansas. So there were about 85 of us regulars there, including officers and enlisted people, and uh, we were there to help train the reservists that came in, and we had we had two squadrons. We flew with. When I first went there, we flew the F-4D, which was a Delta Wing subsonic aircraft, and uh, we were there to train the Marines uh, reservists. They were to do all the work, but we were to supervise them as they did the work on the aircraft and as the pilots flew in that. And September 1 of 1966, I made Sergeant E-5, and when I first went in the Corps, you had to do you had to do at least four years or five to even be eligible, but see, the Marine Corps doubled in size when I was there because of the Vietnam conflict. Oh, okay. So many of the staff NCOs made uh, temporary uh, lieutenants or warrant officers, second lieutenants or warrant officers, and then that opened up the ranks for everybody else. So, And while I was there, we transitioned from the F-4D uh, to the F-8 Crusader, and I was one that was assigned, th this is really what's interesting, I was assigned to teach the pilots all the safety uh, and all the emergency procedures on the new F-8 Crusader. So we had, a, we had the cockpit right there, and they would sit in the cockpit and I had a control panel where I could punch in all the different things that could go wrong with the aircraft and they had to tell me what they would do on each of the emergency procedures. And until I cleared them, they couldn't fly the airplane. As an enlistee that had never flown an airplane, but <laughs> now they all, they all did well. I never did hold anybody back, but they went through all the procedures and you could punch in one trouble or you could punch in two troubles or three troubles. You know, from flame bounce to losing power to all the various things that could happen to the aircraft and how to get it back safely on the ground, you know, and things like that. So that was a, that was a unique opportunity. And there were days that I spent all day just training that, going one pilot after the other, after the other, through it all. And each one of them would probably take an hour when you did it, of all the different possibilities that could occur. 
and they had to walk you through it and, and know what they would do in that kind of a setting. We'd all made NCOs, corporals or sergeants, and none of us had ever been overseas during the Vietnam conflict. Well, they have what they call an inspector general inspection where, where they come in and inspect the base. They found all these sergeants that had never been overseas and they had anywhere from three to three and a half years in the Marine Corps already. Their enlistment was going to run out because they all were enlisted for four years. And we all got orders overseas within two weeks after that uh, happened. So then I got orders to, we all, uh, there, were, there were four of us, no, there were three of us from Olathe, Kansas that, were, that fell into that category. So we got assigned then to go to Camp Pendleton, California, and go through infantry training for a month. One, one checked in earlier than the rest of us did. The one that checked in earlier when he was through training, he flew over to Vietnam. The rest of us got on a troop ship that had been taken out of mothballs from the Korean War, the USS John Pope, and it was run by merchant marines, but there were, I think there were about 500 of us marines on it. So we were sent overseas that way. We left the evening of the 4th of July on San, from San Diego Harbor in San Diego. It took us 14 days to get to Okinawa. And some got off at Okinawa and went north to Japan for duty. And, and uh, a couple of us ended up going south to Vietnam. It was seven more days to Vietnam. On the way to Vietnam, they said the air conditioner went out in, in the holes where we slept. And we, none of us believed they went out, but we believed that they were, you know, climatizing us for Vietnam. So the seven days that we made towards Vietnam, we didn't have any air conditioning. It gets pretty hot oh, and smelly <laughs> <laughs> down in the holes at the time. I was fortunate in the hole that I was in. I happened to be the senior sergeant uh, in, in, in the group. There were three of us sergeants in there. I was the senior one. And uh, they bunked five, five high, and, and where they bunked, you, you basically could hardly turn over. You were that close to get out of the bunk. Well, at the end of the hole, there were three bunks. And since, guess what? Since I was a senior sergeant, I took the top one, and I could sit up on mine. <laughs> there was nothing above me except the, the ceiling of the, of the hole that we were in, you know. And so after that, we made it to Vietnam, and then... And it's, it's, a, it's a, a chilling experience when you come into Vietnam. We came in early in the morning, it was still dark, and all these flares are, are flying in the air. They've lit off flares, and you hear aircraft flying. You don't have, nobody has a weapon. And you think, I'm getting into a war zone. I have no way of defending myself. And, and then we loaded onto trucks, rode the open trucks, and they got us to the bases where we were going, and then we were then we were uh, issued our weapons. We were issued M14s because of the fact that we weren't, you know, basically all we would have to do is, is if we were hit by rockets and during the night, uh, and it was normally during the night, that after we got the all clear and the flares came out, then we had to take perimeter in case we were being ground attacked. So that's, we, I think we had two magazines and an M14. I think we were allowed about 10 rounds probably. Uh, and that was it. I never fired the weapon that, uh, during the time that I was there. When I got to Vietnam then and, and uh, picked up my squadron, the interesting thing is the executive officer of the group there, MAG-11, of, of, uh, of the 1st first, first Air Wing, happened to have been my CO at Olathe, Kansas, and he got orders over there about the same time I did, except he, he went there a little bit earlier because he didn't have to go through the infantry training. So the first man I saw at, at, at MAG-11 at Da Nang, Vietnam, was by my <laughs> commander that I had had at, at Olathe, Kansas. <laughs> Kansas. So I'm standing in, in ranks waiting to get my assignments, and I just hollered out and said, Hi, Colonel Link, how are you doing? He came over and shook my hand, and we visited for a while and said, If you need anything, let me know, you know. So then I got assigned to a squadron there, F-8 Crusaders. We had 14 F-8s that flew 24 hours a day, seven days a week. 
we were supposed to own it. And of course, I took care of all the communication navigation equipment, which makes the radio, the IFF, for identification, friend or foe, the automatic direction fire under the uh, altimeter, and also the TACAN, uh, which uh, gives them the direction they're going and how they're going to get there and getting back again. And uh, I found out I was the, then the senior sergeant. I was coming in when all of the other troops were leaving. They'd done their time. Basically, Marines usually spent 13 months overseas, and then they got then they got assigned back in the United States for a while. I said, well, how many men am I supposed to have in the shop? And they said, well, you're allowed to have 25 working for you. Well, it turned out there were three of us. I was a, uh, I was a sergeant, two guys that came to work there at the same time, uh, right after I got there, had come out of school. They'd never seen an airplane. They'd been through the school that I'd been through, but had never worked on an airplane, had never touched an airplane. So I said, well, here's what I'll do. I you said, got how many of these airplanes? Two, uh, and we had 14. 14, 14 flying, flying 24 yeah, hours. 24 seven. And so I said, uh, I checked them out on how to check things out, and then I had the electricians help them on it. And I said, I'll, ha I'll assign you to days. So our working hours for, for the day crew was 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., seven days a week. And I said, I'll come in and work nights by myself, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., or however long it takes. And I said, you leave, if there's something on the aircraft you can't get fixed by changing out a black fox, just leave me and leave it to me and I'll fix it. I'll troubleshoot it and find it. So, so we did that. We kept them flying 24 hours a day, Saturday yeah. ways. I usually put in probably 14 to 16 hours a day oftentimes. If a wire or something broke in the aircraft, they didn't know how to troubleshoot it and find it and get it repaired. But then eventually our crew picked up again. The interesting thing is when, when we were there, we were the last of four hangars that the Marines had on the south side of the field. The Air Force was on the north side of the field. It was so loud because we were at, at the end of the, air, uh, uh, of the strip where they take off with the afterburners that in the entire time you were down there, you could never talk like I'm talking to you right now. We yelled at one another. We wore our, our ear muffs all the time inside the building, plus we wore swimming ear plugs inside, wow. and then the sound suppressors on the outside. Well, I had extended when I was in Olathe, Kansas, when I made uh, NCO, Corporal, for six years so that I could get pro pay, which was another $75 a month, and in 1960s, that was a lot of money. Good money. <laughs> which always made me one grade ahead, but you had to have six years obligated to get that because I was in a critical field. Well, what they recommended that I would do then when my four years was up is that I would cancel my extension and re-enlist. So I did that, and then I took the hearing test and I couldn't pass the test because I'd been around jet aircraft so oh, long yeah. and okay. so loud. So they shipped me out of country to, to Yokosuka, Japan. I was in the hospital for four months. They canceled my extension because I couldn't pass the hearing test in, in Nam. And, and then I finally passed the test in, in, in the hospital in Yokosuka, Japan. Then they shipped me back to the country as in, you know, I officially was not in the Marine Corps that I'm shipped me back in the country. I was supposed to re-enlist in January, and I ended up re-enlisting in June of the year. So I got, and, and I was going over go six years, and at the last minute I went for three years. So I enlisted for three years, so I was in seven years, four months, and 20 days uh, of that. Then when I got back from Vietnam, I, I got transferred to Marine Corps Air Station, Yuma, Arizona, which is a, as the, as the place of a lot of squadrons. To, we went there when I was training reservists, for them to, for the pilots to get gunnery experience out there on the desert and bombing experience and stuff like that. And, and uh, that was a Marine Corps air station, but it also had a Navy detachment. And the Navy detachment did the intermediate level maintenance, which means he worked on the equipment instead of on the airplanes. And I was assigned to that. So I worked on, I worked in the intermediate level. I didn't work on any planes when I got to Yuma, Arizona. But the, in the seven years and four months and 20 days that I was in the Marine Corps, the only time I was on a Marine station not connected to Navy personnel 
was in basic training and when I was overseas in Vietnam. The rest of the time I was with Navy. We had Navy in the shop with us all the time and all the way through. Especially and with those airplanes because the, the Navy flies both Yeah, ways. they flew the yeah. same thing. When we, see, we, there, was an, there was also a, a Navy uh, squadron, two Navy squadrons at Olathe, Kansas. It was a Naval Air Station is what it was. Marine Corps were, uh, and the Marines were there. Uh, Marine Corps recruiting uh, detachment there. When they transfer, uh, transitioned out of the F-4Ds that we were also flying, they went to the A-4s. They had the A-4s and we had the F-8 Crusaders. Because we thought we were hot dogs then because we had the afterburner aircraft and the A-4, you know, that was pretty slow. So I spent um, the last six months that I was in that I spent as an instructor. And uh, some of the uh, troops, you know, they would say, and you're getting out. I say, yeah, I'm getting out. I feel like I'm supposed to get out of the Marine Corps. And they said, man, the Marine Corps is moving. We're probably going to lose one of the best instructors they've ever had. So I, really? yeah, I got along well with them. We had a good time. It was a great learning experience, you know. The, the fun part about the military is you get the privilege of working with all kinds of people. When you first meet them because they're of a different culture, you think they're strange, but they're real people. They're, they're good people. And you get to, you, you learn how to work with all of them, no matter what, what uh, where they're from, what their training level is, or, or anything. I mean, you just, you get along as a great big family. And of course, you know, the Marines have the motto, you're going to, you'll leave no one behind. You know, and that's the motto, that you just don't leave anybody behind. You help somebody succeed that didn't. And, and they, eventually they all succeed as a result of it. But it was an interesting time. And because of the Marine Corps, I was, I was a high school graduate when I went in. And then, of course, I, I'm, uh, I felt, a, you know, I felt a call. Something was going on in my life that I didn't understand. Eventually I was called to ministry. And because of my Marine Corps experience or military experiences, I got a lot of financial aid going through colleges that I wouldn't have had otherwise. You know, so I don't, I don't begrudge having been in Vietnam uh, because I was part of the program and part of the, uh, the event. And, and uh, I missed some events in Vietnam because I was out of country. I missed the 10 offensive when I was in Vietnam because that was the time that I was in Yokosuka, Japan, trying to pass my hearing test. I missed that before I got there, they had taken a, a hit on, on the armory and the bombs had gone off and everything and, and shook the, the, the buildings terribly. The chapel was uh, considered unsafe for a period of time. And I missed that because I checked in later and went over by ship. So I missed right. two of the worst events in the country because I was somewhere else. Wow. And yet I was where I was supposed to be <laughs> at the time. So that, that was kind of my seven and a half year career anyway. Started producing the F-8 Crusader. Oh wow, yeah. And I, and I think the problem with the F-4D, it, it, it wouldn't have been a carrier bird because it was too heavy. No, the Navy flew it on carriers. But, but it really wasn't good, it wasn't really designed for it. I, I mean, got you. It, it was too heavy an aircraft for the amount of engine that it had. You know, it was so... It was, was that a single or was that twin engine? Single engine. Single engine? Yeah. But it was, and of course it was subsonic, you know. And I, I, I don't know what kind of, I, I never did, I never did uh, know what kind of a load it would carry in that. From a mechanical aspect, was that a good one or was it a dog? Or? It was an easy maintenance bird because it had no, uh, when it's a delta wing, it has no hydraulics. You know, it's, yeah, you've got your you've got your ailerons and that and, and your flaps, but you don't have, you know, when they built the F-111, I mean, that was a total disaster because of the fact that it came, it turned into a delta wing, but then they, they had the, uh, you know, the wings come out when they landed. Well, that was ahead of the time to get, they couldn't get the solenoids and everything working right. So one wing would come out and one wouldn't come out, you know. So oh, I mean, wow. that, that thing was a flying, dis well, it was a disaster. They grounded that so many times. I think it probably ended up being a good airplane. 
But well, they never did achieve what they expected. That was Mac. We call that McNamara's boondoggle on that. He was the one that the choice. We said if they'd have made it a straight delta wing, it would have been a good aircraft. But they tried everything else was ahead of the technology that they had at the time. They hadn't solidified it, the technology, you know. And like we we mothballed the F4Ds when the F8s. Came when we got the F8s. I think we got them in 1965, latter part of 65, or early part of I think it was in 65. So nine years after the bird has started, it's it's no longer in action. And, and you know, look at the you look at the good aircraft. B-52s have been around for 60 over 60 years. You know, mm -hmm. uh, the F4Ds were a lot longer than that, and they were a doggy aircraft, but they had so much power. You know that that was the that was the dirtiest aircraft ever designed. As far as yeah, you know, it was your sheer power that kept it in the air. Really, because uh, the that that Phantom was was it shouldn't have for all purposes should not have been able to fly. Oh, the F four Phantom. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. I mean that was the dirtiest. It was not a pretty bird. Yes, um, Marty Case, one of the guys that I in a, that I interviewed, his uh, son ended up being the aeronautical engineer and they stood in front of an F4 one time and Marty ended up getting checked out in the F1 uh, in the uh, F4 Phantom and stuff and his son said you know look at all the disturbance look, look at the, uh, the the plates for the inlets you know, oh, look, yeah. look how far they're displaced off the, off yeah. the fuse oh, lodge were just... the bent wings it's another you know and even, you know and even the crazy thing is even the Blue Angels flew them for a little while yeah <laughs> no. mm -hmm. But it was just sheer horsepower that kept that thing flying. Flying brick, that's what they yeah. everyone called that yeah. one. Yeah. The F-8 Crusader, it was a pretty, it's one of the prettiest birds in the air. Mm -hmm. Once it gets cleaned up, when they get that wing, uh, when they get the fuselage up against the wing, it's a clean bird. Marty even said that flying the uh, F-4 Phantom, he was, he, one time he kind of hunk, hunk, hunkered over the uh, glare shield for the instrument panel and just looked at the nose and he said the nose was always hunting. Well, probably. Yeah, he was. He was. It would just never find equilibrium. He was. Yeah. He was. The airplane yeah. was always moving. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, I never worked on the A sixes. You know, that was a that was a high tech bird for the Marine Corps, uh, and we had an A six squadron over there when I was in Vietnam. There was two door, two hangars down from us. A six intruder. Yeah. Yeah. You know that was a subsonic, but it was a high tech bird. You know, at that time it. Basically, all the pilot had to do was take it off and land it. It wow. could do everything else itself. Ugly looking thing. Had that remember it had that fueling thing that came straight. The fueling boom field, right, the prop right, up right up out there, the yeah. nose, you know, and that. But yeah, it, it was. It was a good bird for what it did. Oh yeah, it did a lot of reconnaissance. They, stuff. They had a lot of yeah. reconnaissance with it. More reconnaissance, I think, than anything else. But even for bombs, it could carry, they, yeah, it carried it carried, bombs too. Yeah, it carried a pretty decent. They load. did a lot of reconnaissance with it. A lot of them were, were EA sixes, mm -hmm. which means they were reconnaissance birds. Uh, of course, the T thirty three, you know, it's been around f since nineteen forty eight. That shooting star. Yeah, every, you know, uh, everybody that I've spoken to that's flown that thing, they said once you get it going down the runway. Oh yeah, it was so it's, doggy. Yeah. They said it's just you know you go full power, release brakes, and it just starts going. And starts Slowly, going fast finally, <laughs> it's rolling, and you pray you have enough runway. Yeah. Well, they said once you got up to speed, though, they said yeah. it was this beautiful flying yeah. airplane. I I had. There was one day that they decided to let enlisted people ride in the second seat on them. I you know I had hearing problems, so I never dared do it. I had not, but I'd never I'd never, you know, before you flew in a jet aircraft. You were supposed to have a, you know, a hearing test and that, and and to see how you functioned and on high altitude with short shortage of oxygen and stuff like that. And I just didn't want to risk it. But several guys flew that flew that one day in a in a T thirty three. Now the F eight, what what was that uh, from a maintenance aspect? How was that an airplane? Ah, uh, it it was the the. Big issue with it was we had a lot of trouble with the ADF, the automatic direction finder, on it because of the antenna where it was located. The antenna was located between the landing gear uh, 
and invariably it, it, it was prone to have hydraulic leaks and guess where it leaked into it always leaked into that antenna you know and it was a lot of coax cable from that antenna up into the cockpit to get to get the eighty after we were forever changing those antennas out because because of the hydraulic fluid that got into them and just messed up all the electronics of it you know uh, but you know they flew they flew well when you really think about it and and they they flew missions that they were never designed you know they I got the path from armor right they they carried they put pylons on each wing that would carry four 250 pound bombs on each side I mean you know that's what a thousand pounds on each wing uh, they did have the missile launchers on the side of the fuselage and I think they could I don't know if they could mount them on the wings I think they possibly could of course they had them 20 millimeter guns which was we lost a pilot over there that was taking a pilot out on on just uh, leading him around and you know, they show them the territory when they first get there before they ever do any any real sorties fly any sorties and he heard about a bunch of uh, a group of marines that was pinned down and he didn't have any bombs but he had, a, he had his 20 millimeters were loaded and uh, so he went in on a strafing run the guy that was uh, giving an orientation flight to the new pilot and on the strafing run he took a round right through the head really? in the cockpit yeah well, what were the uh, chances of that? and he you know was killed and of course the aircraft crashed and the, the, the real the real bummer about that was he was killed the day his son was born and he wasn't even on a mission when he went into you know other than an orientation flight for somebody else but you know, Marines aren't going to let Marines go without help, and he happened to be in the area, so he, his second strafing run, I guess it was, why the pilots, the other pilot said he took a round right in the head in the cockpit. What's the chance of that happening? But it happens. They always said they liked, Honest, they yeah. always, the Marines said they always liked the Marine pilots the best because they came in the lowest. Absolutely. The Navy would be a lot more hesitant. They'd come in a strafe ring and runs a lot higher, but... Oh, uh, and, and of course ours, we, we, and we had the red nose and the red tail with the white stars and I mean they knew what squadron was coming, it was the VMF 234 when they were coming because we all had, every squadron had their, their different looks on the mm -hmm. aircraft. We lost, uh, we lost him, we lost one other pilot. Bird went down, and we never. There was never an SOS or anything. And I don't think ever to this day that they ever know what happened, whether he went out down out in the ocean or what the case was. We had another pilot that was shot out of the air three times, parachuted three times, and flew the next day every time. Really? And he was our best pilot. He would not down a bird unless it was really needing to be downed. And we, we had one guy that got in a tight spot and had to pull 10, he pulled 10 negative G's. Negative? Negative G's. When he landed that aircraft, there wasn't a rivet in the wing that wasn't popped. I'm we looking. never could figure out how in the world he ever got it back on the ground. Yeah. I mean, especially I mean, negative positive one thing. Yeah, well, yeah. They're, yeah, they're designed yeah. for six minutes, easy, you know. Yeah. But he had to, he was going to jam, and he had to go negative G's. I mean, he went up and over, you know, which, I mean, he, you know, usually he's down and up, and that's the sure. positive G. But he went up and over, and I think he was loaded. I think he had his bombs on yet when it happened. That, that would almost make sense because, boy, ten negative. Ten wow. negative G's. That he, that, and it was a lot of... A lot of skid work to do on that too <laughs> before it threw again. <laughs> Give me some more sheet metal. <laughs> yeah. Once in when I when pilot said sorties, we try, you know, if they, if they they would call and say, you know, there were times that they'd have a tack hand that wouldn't check out when they'd turn it on. Especially at night. If they got if they were running a night sortie, I thought they better be able to get out, and, and they understood that all they had to do was call me. And they'd call me, and I'd come out and say, "What's the problem?" Well, Tack Ann isn't checking out, or the altimeter isn't checking out. 
Well, I said, and I'd, I'd have a black box with me. I said, let me get the data. The engine be running. I'd stand and be standing up on the missile because all of the avionics was on top where you open up the top skin. And the only thing I couldn't change out while they were standing was the radio. Uh, but I could change out the, the tack antis. I'd pull it out and I'd slam another one in and I'd say, the check out? Yeah. I said, well, okay. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll batten the hatch down. When you get back, I'll safety wire everything. And I did that several times. Really? I sent birds out. Just to get them on the mission? Yeah. Or I'd, well, I remember one night the guy said the radio's not checking out and there had been a radio complaint, so I went and read the report. Well, they had taken the coax cable off and checked to see what the transmitter output and it was checked good and they forgot to put the cable back on. So I just opened up the hatch. I said, I know what's wrong. I think I know what's wrong. Got in there, put it back on, patted it on. I said, work it. Yep, go. I said, I'll finish it when you get back. Wow. I mean, you just, you know, you felt like there, there were lives out in the field that uh, those guys were depending on those yeah. aircraft to get there. You know. Did you ever have any, uh, besides the one that 10 negative Gs, did you have any, have any birds come back with notice, noticeable damage? That was the only one, really. really. You know, we were fortunate. We didn't. They didn't take rounds through. Well, once in a while they'd take a round through it, but most of the time they didn't, you know. I think particularly more enhanced with the Marine Corps is the sense of camaraderie. Yeah, we have, you know, the sense for fire, which means always faithful. And uh, I think one of the reasons we were very close is we were the smallest branch of the military. Known in some ways to be the toughest overall. Now, uh, there's, a, there's special forces in every branch of the military that are tough, but we had the longest basic training with the 13-week basic training, with four weeks added to that of infantry training, basic infantry training, which was like a 16-week of basic training, really, you know. Uh, actually, well, 17 weeks when you really stopped to think about it. So you could figure four months you were gonna be in before you had any privileges of any kind uh, to go home or leave the base or anything like that. So, yeah, and that, and of course, you know, we would spar between one another, but if it was a civilian going after any branch of the military, we'd be on top of them <laughs> immediately. You know, we've. There's always been that friendly, friendly sparring between, especially between the Navy and the Marines, because sure. they've been so close. Marines have always been with the Navy. Navy's always been with the Marines on a lot of things. See, since every Marine is 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 a rifleman number one, then the Navy provides all the medical doctors, the corpsmen, and things like that. So you always were, you always had Navy personnel. Whether you were on ship or whether you were on a Marine Corps base or wherever, you always had Navy personnel with you, and that's so, it. You know, we just learned to work together, and and we flew the same aircraft a lot of times, and and, and that's so. We shared in the training responsibilities. That's why I was a naval uh, naval technical training center so much of the time because I was sharing the experience of learning or sharing the experience of teaching and teaching the sailors along with the Marines and that that happened to be going through the, the class at the time. So it, it, was, it was a good experience. <laughs>